Good morning. morning. Thanks for worshiping with us today. Um, Today we say goodbye to our frequent guest musician, Jenny Seiler, who will be concentrating more on ministry and preaching. Thank you, Jenny, for providing the lovely music for us these past months. We will hold a special reception after worship today in the church lounge for a farewell, um, and also a birthday celebration for our dear friend, Betty Pruden, whose birthday is today. All are welcome to join us for cake and conversation. Um, Next Sunday, session has designed September 4th for online worship only. It's Labor Day weekend, so keep in mind that the church office will be closed on Monday, September 5th. There's going to be another blood drive. Um, The Red Cross will hold the blood drive um, this Tuesday, August 30th, from 11.30 to 6 p.m. There's a critical shortage of blood supply across the country. Please donate if you can to set up an appointment, follow the instructions posted on our church bulletin boards, or you can also drop in to give blood and they'll fit you in when they, when they can. Um, another session announcement is beginning September 1st, we will, receive, we will welcome a new staff member, Reverend Lindsay Anderson. Reverend Anderson will work part-time fulfilling our monthly pulpit supply needs in addition to other duties. You'll have a chance to meet her soon. And then lastly, for announcements, just a reminder to pray for those on our prayer list. Andrew Barth, Kathy Brower, Ali Hogan, Ellen Hornfisher, Dorothy Seabrooks, and Jane Walling. Jane will have knee replacement surgery this week. Now let us hear and respond to the call to worship. God calls us to service rather rather than than honor. honor. God calls us to love the unknown rather than than the familiar. We come to this time of worship Trusting Trusting in the the grace grace of Jesus Jesus Christ, Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Please stand for our opening hymn.
God invites us to mutual love, but to find that mutuality, we must release our need of honor, our desire for privilege. In humility, let us seek forgiveness, trusting in the promises of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us pray, pray the prayer of confession together. Merciful God, oh God forgive, forgive us, us for we exalt ourselves and mock and the humble. We choose, we choose to believe we are self-sufficient rather than trust in your strength. Open us to your spirit that we might serve all people without regard to the outcome, devoting ourselves to your honor alone. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God rejoices when we repent and return, offering us finest wheat and honey from the rock to sustain us in new life. Rejoice, for you have been reconciled to God and to one another. With joy, seek the honor of God's service. Amen. God of wisdom, open us to the work of your spirit that we may hear and faithfully respond to your holy word. Amen. The first scripture reading is from Psalms 112. Praise the Lord. Happy are those who fear the Lord, who greatly delight in his commandments. Their descendants will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in their houses and their righteousness endures forever. They rise in the darkness as a light for the upright. They are gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with those who deal generosity and lend, who conduct their affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. They will be remembered forever. They are not afraid of evil tidings. Their hearts are firm, secure in the Lord. Their hearts are steady. They will not be afraid. In the end, they will look in triumph on their foes. They have been distributed freely. They have given to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. The horn is exalted in honor. The wicked see it and are angry. They gnash their teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked comes to nothing. That is the word of the Lord. Thank you. 
The second, the second, is mine not on? The second, the third. Oh, the second. There we go. <clears throat> they didn't teach this to us in seminary. The second passage reading comes from Luke chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. Just then, in front of him, there was a man who had dropsy. And Jesus asked the lawyers and Pharisees, is it lawful to cure people on the Sabbath or not? But they were silent. So Jesus took him and healed him and sent him away. Then he said to them, if one of you has a child or an ox that has fallen into a well, will you not immediately pull it out on a Sabbath day? And they could not reply to this. When he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both of you may come and say to you, give this person your place. And then in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place so that when your host comes, they may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He, also, he said also to the one who in, had invited him, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return, and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's passage shows us once again how Jesus is always showing us how countercultural he truly is. He tends to offer probing questions and, and tells stories that open people's minds to curiosity and allows them space to explain themselves or explore alternatives. Looking around at the pattern of his fellow guests as they have sat down at the table, here in today's passage, Jesus tells them a parable that could have very well played out in real time. The setting of the parable is one of Jesus' go-to scenes, a wedding feast. We've heard it a couple times. It doesn't feel all that much like a parable. In fact, it reads more like advice to the unfolding situation in front of them. But by calling it a parable, Jesus is alerting us to the fact that he is about to share some deep wisdom that goes beyond this moment and beyond the people there, beyond the characters of this story. Jesus isn't just telling them what they should have done this time. Jesus is depicting how they should be all the time. Jesus transforms this space in order to reform the community. In this passage, the Pharisees and Jesus are closely watching each other. However, the way the Pharisees tend to watch Jesus doesn't usually lead to them receiving his wisdom. They're nitpicky. We see this time and time again throughout the Gospels. It is interesting to note that in the original Greek of this passage of the, Bible, of the New Testament, the word guests is actually in the form of a Greek perfect participle. I knew what that was 10 years ago. I no longer do. But the commentary shares that this literally means those who are invited. Just one word, guests, is those who are invited. From the very beginning, Luke is underscoring that we are perpetual guests. This is the first point of wisdom from the table. 
We are always the guest invited to life and the table by the creator. As people who know that they are always guests, this point of, point of table wisdom should not come as a big surprise. It is better to be humble than to assume one's position or importance in any space where one is the guest. The place of honor was right beside the host, and to automatically place yourself right beside the host is a way of saying, I know that if only one person were to be invited to this dinner, our host would want it to be me. You're not just saying something about yourself, actually, in that moment. You're saying something about everybody else that is invited. And here's where Jesus' story makes the surprise turn. You're making it so that the host has to say something to you. Awkward. For if there is someone more distinguished and respectable than you, then your host is going to have to humble you in front of everyone. And as part of Luke's great reversal, the first shall be last disgraced, shamed for thinking too highly of themselves. Instead of putting ourselves in a position where we have to be told to go sit somewhere, Jesus tells us to start with that posture. Instead of being at a place of honor, Jesus tells us to go to the farthest boundary area. This, too, is part of God's table wisdom. You see, it's table wisdom because it leaves the opportunity for the host not to dis for host to not disgrace you, but to lift you up, to call you a friend and seek to honor you in the presence of the others who are sharing the table with you by moving you to the closer to the center of things. This sort of promotion ha is what happens when we are not self-seeking, not when we are humbled, but when we ourselves are humble. While the parable itself is a lovely and simple story, it can be a hard pill to swallow. Taking the posture of humble guests, we may have great blessing and honor heaped upon us, but if we try to push our own grandeur onto others, we will most definitely have humiliating experiences of being shown what people really think of us. Though we are perpetual guests, Jesus recognizes that we also have the power to be hosts who invite others to this table. When it comes to life in this world, there are times when we find ourselves as the brokers of influence and belonging. This is why it is important for us to remember another aspect of the table wisdom, that if we place ourselves on the boundaries as the guests, then we'll know the kinds of people we should invite to our own tables. A few weeks ago, we had a breakfast that the men of the church lovingly cooked for us. Deliciously, too. Thank you, men. I noticed something today. Most of the men sit on that side. Most of the women sit on this side. I just noticed. Anyways. One of the intentional things about that breakfast was that we would all be sitting together at one great big table together. There was no position of honor. There was no position higher or lower. It was just one big great table, simply that we are at this table together. However, you may, have remem you may remember or have noticed that there were two round tables off to the side, and we had people who sat there after they had served all the others, made sure everybody had a plate of food and a cup of juice or a cup of coffee. And I saw it to be a beautiful vision of a table much like one in today's parable. However, in our breakfast and table of plenty, people sought to serve with humility and grace. Yes, I know the other table was my brother and his family, but I'm not talking about that table. I'm talking about the other table. The way to practice humility as a host is to be generous with one's invitations. 
This is the second aspect of God's table wisdom for setting yourself at the furthest boundary, a table of misfits, a table of nobodies, people who are they themselves in great need and are really never probably going to be in a position to return the favor. They're the ones who ought to be present. If we host with humility, just like we are humble guests, then we will expect nothing but to share the space with others. Because you see, we choose instead to be with those from whom we will get something in return, whether actual things or opportunities, a sense of belonging, love. If we invite someone so that next time, when it's their turn to invite, they will think of us, we've already shown that our eyes are on that best seat in the house. In other words, we're thinking of ourselves in the future, even though we've got hungry people to serve right here, right now, in our own house, at our own table. A posture of generosity towards those who will never be able to repay you is not wasted, even if it feels like it is. That's the last piece of endless wisdom from this table. From Christ in our text today, generosity, like humility, will be reciprocated by the hosts of hosts when the righteous are raised up and resurrection is itself the generous act of God to exalt a humble human to eternal life. God's table wisdom is to not worry about how good of a seat you have right now. God's table wisdom is to give as many downcast, needy people as possible a good seat of equality, equity, experience right now. God's table wisdom is to be generous with the life that God has invited you to live, that God has invited you to have. God's table wisdom is to follow his seating chart, trusting that fellowship will occur among a whole bunch of people who are different because the Spirit weaves them together. God's table wisdom is to remember that even when we're hosts, we are always God's guest. So if we see our church as a table as a, as a table, and we are the host, then what is the kind of table that we want to put out? How do we invite our guests? Who do we invite to be a part of this table? How can we make sure that the seats are as honorable, good, equitable, generous, comfortable, all the good adjectives, as possible without seeking anything in return? I don't know the answer to that. That's what we have committees for. Um, but when we are done, we can also always turn to God's table and rest in God's presence as God's guest. Amen. <laughs>
Please join in the refrain, hear our prayer whenever you hear the words, God of mercy. Let us pray to the Lord saying, God of mercy. Gracious God, you call us to relinquish the cares and concerns of our lives to you so that we might serve you in perfect freedom. Hear us as we bring before you the petitions of our hearts and minds. <clears throat> God of mercy, hear our prayer. We offer our prayers for the church, the universal church. May our words and actions bring honor to your name and teach us true humility. God of mercy, hear our prayer. We offer our prayers for the needs of the world. May peace pervade in all places of conflict and violence. God of mercy, hear our prayers. We offer our prayers for those who suffer from sickness of mind, body, or spirit, and all those who care for them. God of mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for those who have died who now worship in the presence of Christ himself today. And we pray for those who will die today or tomorrow. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, you call us to follow with your, you with faithfulness even when it challenges our relationships and the values of our culture. Help us to release our fears, nurture us in your ways, and sustain us as we seek your peace. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and glory forever. Amen. Let us rise for the final hymn, God be the love to search and keep me.
Friends, I leave you with a blessing today that says, may the God of mystery take you to unexpected places. May the God of humility teach you to serve without pride. May the God of wisdom inspire your work in the kingdom. And the blessing of God, creator, redeemer, and sanctifier be with you now and always. Amen.